Safinatu Kamara, Nancy Sise, Emma Kamara. We are putting names to climate migration. These three women were farmers. They worked in the Port Loka district of Northern Sierra Leone. But year after year, they faced the reality of climate change. Safinatu grew rice. And when you grow rice in her village, you borrow the input from those with the wealth. So you borrow a bag of rice seeds, but then at the end of the harvest, you've got to repay two bags of rice seeds. And Safinatu explained to me that when the rain didn't come one year, she was left with a debt she couldn't pay. She held on and she held out, and the next year, she borrowed again. But again, the rain didn't come. And so she was left with the debt of four bags of rice, a debt she couldn't pay. So she moved, came down to Susan's Bay to visit her aunt and to ask her for the money to pay the debt. She never went back to Port Loco. Emma's story and Nancy's stories are very similar. Because of the effect of climate, Emma described it as having red rice when there isn't enough rain. And Nancy talked about how when you are farming in their context, you have to borrow money to gather other people to help you to sow the seeds because you have to cook for them. So if the rain doesn't come and the harvest doesn't come, then you've still got to pay that debt. But how do you pay it? This is the reality of climate-induced migration. They explained to me that they chose to move to Freetown and into this particular informal settlement, Susan's Bay, because the rent was cheap. They said it was about 15,000 leones, which is just over a dollar and 20 cents for those who are listening elsewhere, a month. The rent might sound cheap, but the cost, the actual cost of living in a slum community is incredibly high. Nancy explains how the garbage would run into the accommodation, how the heat of being in a corrugated iron dwelling meant that it was always difficult to breathe, how during the rainy season you were always concerned because you knew the floods would likely come, and how in the dry season the likelihood of being affected by a fire was just too close for comfort. And most of us in Freetown know that for those three women in Susan's Bay community, they actually experienced a fire on the 24th of March this year that left 7,000 people homeless as the flames blazed through the community. Climate-induced migration is not only happening here in Freetown. According to the UN, between 25 million and a billion people are going to be forced to move from their homes by 2050 because of climate-related challenges. And in a similar period, the World Bank is saying 217 million of those movements are going to be within borders. And of that 217 million, 86 million will be in sub-Saharan Africa. We are experiencing today a climate migration 
which is already a global phenomenon. But in our context, that migration has meant that Freetown now has 74 informal settlements. We call them informal settlements, we call them slum communities, but we know the picture. Communities that where people are deprived of good housing, have poor access to sanitation and health facilities, have very little by way of road access, compounding that vulnerability. Because when the fires come, and this year alone, we've experienced 37 fires in Freetown, most of them in informal settlements. When the fires come, the fire trucks can't get in because there are no roads. There is no access. So those who left vulnerability caused by climate find themselves now facing increased vulnerability. Our informal settlements are typically along our mountain sides, which is why the Lion Mountain no longer looks like a mountain, or along the coast where mangroves are decimated with the res resulting loss of the ecosystem, biodiversity, fishes, birds, and of course, the pollution into the sea. Climate change is real, and climate change is affecting Africa today. Climate migration is now a factor of life. We would love to see more of an investment in mitigation in those areas of the country where people are being forced to flee because they can't make ends meet anymore, because they have become so vulnerable. But we can't wait for that to happen. We need to be prepared to receive those who are coming in a manner which does not leave our city overall more vulnerable than it was. African cities are growing at the fastest rate of all cities on the globe. It is estimated that the growth of cities by, by 2050 75% of the world's population will live in cities, and that 90% of that city growth will happen in Africa. What do we do in Freetown to ensure that we have resilience, to ensure that our city, and this is not the case to date, because we have seen these 74 communities develop with no development control. We have seen a sprawl. We have seen the poor housing I mentioned, the lack of access to facilities, the lack of water. But it doesn't need to be this way. The most effective way for us to comprehensively prepare and address the move of people into the city, the significant increase in our city's population, is through development control. And what does that mean? That means land use planning. That means zoning. That means instituting an effective building control regime which is sensitive to environmental considerations, which says, for example, you cannot build on a hillside which is more than, has more than a 25 degree slope which says you cannot claim that you have five acres of land into the sea, which you're actually going to bank with garbage, but which also accommodates those who have no access to land. Because when we talk about climate change and climate action, we must also talk about climate justice. Those who are the most vulnerable cannot continue to suffer because they are already disadvantaged. In our context here in Sierra Leone, the Local Government Act of 2004 actually devolves these powers to the local authorities. However, in reality, those powers are not yet devolved, and therefore this development control that we so badly need is not yet being implemented. We won't despair. 
we must always look for solutions. And therefore, at City Council, we have plans. Those plans include already developing a strategy for the improvement and upgrade of informal settlements. Those plans include doing local area plans for places such as Lomli and Malama that are growing very rapidly. Those plans also include having a local area plan for our central business district. And you'll be really pleased to know that the city of Zurich is partnering with us so that we can completely regenerate this area that we call the CBD, giving it new pavements, green space, lighting, and improved roads. But what warms my heart the most, and what is so central to not only addressing the future challenge, but the challenge of today, is the fact that we're now working on plans to upgrade five of our informal settlements. We will be working with Moiba, Rokupa, Coconut Farm in the east, and then in the west, with fantastic development partners who have stood by our side. We are working on plans to upgrade Cockle Bay community and Collet Town community. And what does an upgrade of a community mean in the context of climate change and in the context of resilience? It means that those vulnerabilities that people are experiencing in these communities are addressed through planning. It means that we're taking a community-centered approach where we are doing what seems like the most obvious thing to do. We are understanding from the people through a survey who they are, where they're from, why they're here, how they make their living, and what are they prepared to do to ensure that their community is improved. The Slum Dwellers Association have a slogan and it's simple and so effective. Upgrade where possible, relocate where necessary. And where, and when you have that at the heart of a participatory approach that we have built with the community, it means that we've been able to sit together, we have looked at the map, we have done the geotech studies, and we've said here, it's relocation. Can't live here, it's not safe. Here, it's upgrade. But with the upgrade, how do we design it? We're not going to tell you, you tell us what's going to work for your community. Today, we can proudly say that the Cockle Bay community had designed a new structure, a new plan for how they're going to live. We will have, we will have hopefully, by the start of next year, working with partners who I will name, CRS, working with partners, the ability for us to begin construction of an upgraded slum community, which will no longer be a slum. Because, because what the slum dwellers also say is, do not take the person out of the slum, take the slum out of the person. So we are taking the slums out of our communities because they are there and they are here. And what would actually be our long-term goal is to scale this up and to scale it out so that we are collectively working together, able to build that resilience for those who have found themselves in the most vulnerable places, but also build the resilience for us all. Because if we continue to have indiscriminate deforestation, indiscriminate destruction of our mangroves, the people who suffer are not limited to those who live in the informal settlements. All of us, all of Freetonians, are suffering from the impact of this devastation. Climate change is here. Climate action is required. Resilience is strengthened through effective development control. We remain hopeful as a local authority 
that the central government will, sooner rather than later, devolve these functions because climate change requires urgent responses and we urgently need to put this sort of planning in place, not just in a few communities, but really across our city. But resilience is not limited to urban planning and development. Resilience is about what each and every single one of us does, what our contribution is towards addressing the climate crisis, whether it's through waste collection, whether it's through entrepreneurship, whether it's through reducing uh, sanitary pads getting into the ocean, whether it's about sensitizing our communities, strengthening our women, whether it's just about making sure that you use Find me in freetown.com and somebody picks up your garbage and it doesn't end up in the gutters. And the thing about Freetonians, the thing that makes what we have embarked on as a city so remarkable is that this journey is not a journey that we as the city council are going on on our own. This is a journey that every Freetonian is walking along with us. So I want to today Thank us all for what we've done and encourage us all to keep on moving forward. Climate change can be addressed. Climate action is possible. Climate ambassadors are sitting here in the room. Thank you.